uh, with me to the book of John, John chapter 13. John chapter 13, and we're going to be in um, John chapter 13, and uh, Brother Aaron, do you have the slides? I noticed the, the uh, TV's not back there, so I'm going to have to glance to my side to, oh, there we go, John chapter 13, there's the reference for you. And I want to begin reading in verse number 31. John chapter 13, verse number 31. And uh, here is a portion of scripture uh, where Jesus was uh, with his disciples and Judas has, has left. In, va- in fact, in verse 31, they're in the upper room there. And verse 31, it says, Now uh, when he, that's uh, Judas, has gone, uh, we'll pick up here where it talks, uh, Jesus is now speaking to the, um, the 11 here, and he says, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, Whether shall I go, ye cannot come. So now I must say to you, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Now, if you have been in our adult Sunday school class, you know we normally I would be having you turn to the book of uh, 2 Samuel, and we'd be in the Old Testament there, and uh, we're looking at, uh, we're currently in a series studying the life of David. And, at, at, you know, we're at the point in David's life uh, where uh, he is king in, there in Jerusalem, and there is a relative peace and prosperity in the land. And uh, the next lesson in the series, uh, I was going to have, uh, or we're going to be looking in uh, uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 11, which uh, tells a very uh, familiar story, I'm sure, to many of you. That's when David committed a very grievous sin. Now, all sin, as you know, is terrible, of course. All sin is terrible. Um, David's sin started with him not being where he should have been. The Bible says in uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 11 that David tarried still in Jerusalem. So uh, this was a time when he should have been busy at war with his men, but he stayed there in Jerusalem and uh, he acted upon seeing Bathsheba there, and uh, if you know the story, he ordered the murder of uh, her husband, uh, Uriah, attempted to cover up things. And uh, in the lesson that, uh, our next lesson in in our adult Sunday school uh, class here that we're going to be looking at is is the sin's tangled web. And, you know, one of the complications, if you want to call it uh, that, one of the complications of sin is that it just doesn't affect one person. It quite often uh, not only affects you, but quite often the uh, the consequences are great and far-reaching to other people. And God, of course, sees all that we do, and we can be sure our sin finds us out. Well, um, you know, with today being Mother's Day, I, uh, you know, I, I like to sometimes mix things up, and uh, I'm not a, I don't like ruts and routines, and so uh, as I was studying that portion of scripture, and uh, every once in a while, I bring a different lesson, and so this morning, uh, we are going to uh, bring a different lesson. We're going to get out of our, our regular uh, series there. You know, another component of sin is that not only does God, of course, know when we sin, but usually our mothers know when we sin too. <laughs> Isn't that right? So um, rather than continuing on with our regular Sunday school uh, series, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring a lesson, a lesson on love. And so, uh, you know, of course, with today being Mother's Day, I do think a lesson on love, and I, you know, I was looking back, I've not actually taught a lesson on love. Uh, and so this will be, uh, not that I'm unloving, but, you know, it, it's good. It's a doctrine in the Word of God. And so I think it's very fitting for us because, you know, oftentimes here in this life, um, you know, moms are really, uh, they are 
some of the, quite often the ones on earth that love us the most. And so um, I also didn't think teaching on Bathsheba on Mother's Day would be a very popular move. <laughs> so um, anyway, you know, Mom, uh, let's get to the lesson. I want us to... I want us to consider what Jesus says here in verse number 34, verse number 34 and 35. Because what Jesus says here in verse 34 and verse number 35, let me read it again. It says, he says to his disciples, a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have have love one to another. And, you know, right here, Jesus is giving a commandment uh, or really a new doctrine to his disciples. And there's, uh, you know, several things I want to point out. It's a new commandment, but he says as uh, the, the love that we're to have is to be as he has loved. And so it's not a half-hearted type of love. It's an all-in love. And it's demonstrated in verse number 35. He gives some, some examples or some, here's how uh, there's proof of love. And so, you know, if, if there was one area that we as Christians and, and we as a church ought to really strive to just excel in and uh, be fanatical about, it is in the area of love. First Peter 4, verse number 8 says, And above all things... Have fervent charity among yourselves. Above all things, you know, there are many things that we do as Christians and, you know, where to, uh, you could go down the list, but Peter says in 1 Peter 4, verse 8, above all things, have fervent charity. And so in our lesson here this, uh, this morning, I want to just look at briefly at two areas. I want to talk, uh, well, I want to define what biblical love is, and then what are those areas that it is demonstrated in our life? And so many of you know um, the word here uh, translated in our text is agape. And uh, elsewhere in the word of God, of course, uh, the word charity is often used in replace of the word love. And um, charity is it's a self-giving love. The opposite of that would be a lust, right? We have lusts and desires. Those are all self-directed. Uh, but um, charity is about giving to others. And I just want to mention a few things uh, here about love and uh, biblical love. And the first is that in verse 34, verse 34, if you look here, Jesus says, A new commandment I give unto you. And he says this, that ye love one another as I have loved you. And so the first thing that we see as we try to define what uh, the Bible talks about in love is that it is a Christ-like love, as Christ has loved. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 10, a very familiar passage of Scripture, uh, it tells us this, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's what this means. It's, it's not a, uh, you know, love is, is part of God's nature. That's who he is. And Christ didn't start loving us after we sinned. No, he loved us from before the foundations of the world. It's just, it's just part of who he is. It's not a reaction. Or a, he didn't respond with love, uh, but it's who he is. A Christ-like love is unconditional. Romans 5 verse 8 says, while we were yet sinners, Jesus loves you and I, even though we are sinners. And uh, he's, he doesn't pick and choose. And it certainly is a Christ-like love when we ask the question, what is that? What, what is a Christ-like love? What does that look like? Well, it's motivated uh, toward others, and Christ died, he died for us, the Bible says. And so listen to some of these scripture verses that I have up on the screen for you. Um, in John chapter 15, verse 30, or 13, the Bible says, Greater love hath no man than this, 
that a man lay down his life for his friends. It's speaking of Jesus. He set the example. That's a Christ-like love. In Romans chapter 12 and verse number 9, we're instructed here to let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. To be kindly affectionated one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. I want to give you some more scripture on this point. What is a Christ-like love all about? Jesus says that we're to love one another as he has loved us. And in Romans chapter 13, verse 10, it tells us that love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So love seeks out the best for others. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And then one final verse. And this, this is what a Christ-like love is. What is biblical love? How are we to, above all things, have fervent charity among ourselves? It's to have a Christ-like love. And last verse under this is 1 John 3, 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And so, as we are looking at biblical love and this new commandment that Jesus gave, we are to have a Christ-like love. But this Christ-like love, if you're saved, understand this, you have it already within. It is spiritually natural. And so, this love that is being talked about is a natural outcome of your salvation. Let me show you what the Bible says. In Romans chapter 5 and verse number 5, it says this, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. How? By the Holy Ghost, which is given unto you. Now, let me ask you this question. What happens when a person trusts Christ as their Savior? Who comes and indwells the believer? It's the Holy Spirit. That's the gift. It's The Bible says it's the earnest of our salvation. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in our life, and it is, a, it is given to us. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. We're not born with that spiritual nature, but when we accept Jesus as our Savior and get saved, we are given the Holy Spirit, and he's the seal of and he's the earnest, and he comes and takes up residence. And with that, we are given the love of God. So if you're saved this morning, you have the love of God inside of you. And, of course, the Bible in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And the first fruit of the Spirit is love. Um, then... Moving on in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it's up on the screen for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 9. It says this, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. There again, when a person is saved, they have the Holy Spirit given to them. The love of God is indwells them, and it's the Holy Spirit with the Word of God that teaches us. And, and uh, this verse is in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9, tells us that, um, that ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. You know, and in fact, lo this love, it's a proof of salvation. In fact, it's, a, it's, a, it's one way that you can know that you have issue, you have the, the assurance of salvation. 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 this time, it says this, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. One of the proofs, one of the, the ways that you can know you have salvation is if you have a love for the brethren. 
for those in this church? If you do you do you come to church and do you have a love for one another? Hey, that's an assurance. That's that's proof that you have the Holy Spirit in your life. You have the love of God. Here's the good news. If you're saved, you have this love within. All that needs to happen is that our love needs to increase and abound. And so uh, I don't actually I don't have this verse, but if you want to turn over to First Thessalonians chapter three. First Thessalonians chapter three, verse number twelve. So we're talking about this Christ-like love, and I've just shown you through these scriptures that this love is its our spiritual nature. It's the natural outcome of a child of God or a, a person who is, is a child of God. It's natural for them. But, you know, we as Christians don't always act uh, with a Christ-like love, do we? And part of the reason for that, it's not that we need to go out and find that. If you're saved, you have it already within. But what needs to happen is that love needs to increase and abound. And that's what 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 12 says. It says here, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one towards another, and toward all men, even as we do towards you. And so that love that we have within, that we have, needs to just grow. It just needs to abound. It's there if you're saved, but we need to have it abound. Now, another thing as we, we consider, as we're defining, what is, what is biblical love here? This love that Jesus talks about, this new commandment that I give unto you, he says that ye love one another as I have loved you, um, and that ye love one another, he says. What is it? Well, it's a Christ-like love. It's, a spirit, it's, part, it's an outcome of your salvation. It's not, a, it's not a, a, a sentimental or sappy or a emotion. A lot of people think that's what love is. You know, one of the things about true true uh, biblical love is it doesn't overlook sin. And a lot of parents will uh, with, you know, it, it's, it's a problem if they overlook a child's sin. That's not, you know, the Bible says chasing a, a, a child or a son with, while he's young, right? And, um, and it, the Bible talks about a, a parent that doesn't discipline out of love uh, isn't doing their kids any favors in fact it, it it's in some ways saying you hate them and so you understand love doesn't overlook sin or error revelation chapter 3 and verse number 19 jesus is speaking here to the church of the laodiceans and they had faults and we've studied this before the church was very worldly and he says this, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And so uh, it's, you know, uh, sometimes they, I think they call it tough love. And it's a real thing. Love is zealous for righteousness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 6, it says it rejoiceth not in iniquity or sin, but rejoiceth in the truth. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, it commands us to speak the truth in love. And so truth and righteousness are hand in hand with this love that we are to, to show one another. The last thing I'll say about love here, and as we just are talking about what is this type of love, this new commandment that Jesus has given, is that it's the bond that holds our church together. It ought to be the bond that holds our church together. By this, the Bible says in verse number 35, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. You know, we could have a church, and perhaps you visited churches that you walk in and you know right away there's not a lot of love going on here. Uh, maybe there's fighting, there's tension, uh, there's division. 
And that's not how the Lord's churches ought to be. They ought to be a place of love. And uh, people will see that. People, when they walk in those doors, they ought to, to see our church uh, go up to them and, and really show the uh, love. And, and we ought to show love one to another. In fact, Paul, when he was writing to the church there in Colossae, he spoke about his desire for them. Um, his desire for this local church in Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 1, it was to be knit together in love. Love above all things, have fervent love one towards another. And in uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, For I would, for I would that, ye, um, that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea. And for as many as I have not seen my face in the flesh, that your hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement and the mystery of God and of the Father and of, and of Christ. And then a little bit later in the very next chapter, we see him say, um, verses well, 12, and um, well, he says in verse number 14, and above all these things, put on charity. This was Paul's desire for the church. Love is the bond that holds our church together. And, but Jesus goes on, and he, he, in verse number 34, well, verse number 35 of our text, John chapter 13, and he, he says that, he goes on, so that, that's what love is, if we were to define it, but he goes on and he says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one towards another. And so lastly, I just want to look at a few areas that we are to demonstrate our love. How do we demonstrate the love of God? You know, love is, it's an intangible. And you can't, can't uh, taste it, can't touch it, can't see it. It's very real. We all know that it's real. But it's um, in a lot of ways, it's like faith. It's like salvation. Uh, you know, one of the uh, illustrations uh, for that is, is the wind. As the wind blows, you can't see the wind. In fact, this morning, um, my wife opened up the windows to let some of the, uh, the cool air come in. And it was pretty breezy around our house. And, uh, and things were just being blown all over the place. I couldn't see the wind, but I sure saw the effects of the wind. That's, what, uh, that's really what salvation is. You can't see it. It's not tangible, but you, you uh, know it's real. It's like faith. James chapter 2 and verse 18 says, I will show thee my faith. How? By my works. And so you, that's like the wind. You can see the effects of it. You can't see it, though, um, in and of itself. But I will show thee my faith by my works. Love is, is just like that. It's, it is only real by its demonstration. You can talk about it all you want, but you know it's real when you, uh, when you see it in action. The Bible gives us three basic directions or ways we demonstrate our love. And this is what I want to leave you with this morning. And the first is, uh, well, it's, it's in our text. Um, we're going to look at this. One, we need to show a love towards God, of course. We need to show a love towards our church family or the brethren. And then we need to show a love towards the lost or towards others. And so let me, uh, let me mention this. How do we show our love for God? Well, it is demonstrated by simple obedience. Obedience to his word. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 15, Jesus said, if ye love me, tell me you love me. No, that's not what he said. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Keep my words, keep my, um, 
keep my commandments. And then a little bit later on in that very same chapter, Jesus answered and said unto him, if, if a man love me, he will keep my words. And so we show, we demonstrate our love for God by obeying his words, by obeying the word of God. What he tells us to do, we obey it. That's how we demonstrate our love to God. And, you know, it cannot be half-hearted or a divided love. It has to be complete. And the Bible talks about you can't serve two masters. Uh, you either, you, you've got to choose. You can't serve God in this world. Uh, the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. You can't love the world and love God at the same time. The Bible talks about uh, the love of money. And again, money's not in and of itself wrong, but the love of it and putting that before God certainly is a problem. And so we demonstrate our love for God, for the God who saved us, the God who gave us eternal life, the God who rescued us from the pits of hell where we were headed, right? When we were lost, we were on our way to an eternity without God an eternity uh, in the lake of fire. And it was God who, it was God sending Jesus to earth to die for us. He saved us. If you're saved this morning, you've been spared from that. And then it's the God that benefits us in the here and now. The, the blessings that he gives us in the here and now. Life is good. Is uh, He blesses us today. We don't have to wait for heaven. We can look forward to that, and we should. But how do we demonstrate our love to a God who did all of that for us? Well, we simply demonstrate it through obedience. We demonstrate our love for him through obedience to his word. And so our love needs to be demonstrated three ways. The first and foremost and most important, I think, is it needs to be demonstrated to God. And we do that by obeying his word. But number two we also need a love for the brethren. And so if you are, if you're saved, you have the love of God dwelling within you and you need that to abound and grow. Uh, we need to, our love for God ought to grow uh, just like our love for one another. And so many of you, you're members of this local church and um, we ought to have love for one another. Now, how do we demonstrate our love to one another. Well, we do that through our actions or our deeds. Over in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 17, it says this, But whoso hath this world's goods, and seeth his brother in, uh, have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. And so that's how we demonstrate our love to one another, not just by, by saying uh, a, good, a good comforting word. No, it's by, by, um, through our actions, through our deeds. This passage of Scripture is talking about if you have a, a brother or a sister in the church that has a need and you have the resources, the ability to help them out, you ought to help them out. That's how we demonstrate the love of God. And it's more than just doing. It's actually the, motive, uh, the motives behind your actions. Those matter too. That's what second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 3 says this. You can do a lot of good things. You can, you can, uh, you can give. And um, it says in verse number 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. And so just as important as our actions, are, how do we demonstrate love for the brethren? It's through our deeds. But we also have to have uh, demonstrate, or we, we have to have love with that, right? It's not, out of, don't, it's not a begrudging type of help. Of course, the Bible talks about giving uh, our offerings and tithes. We ought to do it cheerfully. I think we ought to cheerfully help one another in the church. That's how we demonstrate love. 
charity here, of course, is um, is talking about love. You know, when you have the opportunity to help a brother or sister out in the church, what a great opportunity to demonstrate God's love in your life, right? That love, the love of God that you received at the time of your salvation, you're showing that love to one another. So I said there were three areas that we are to demonstrate our love. First is towards God. Second is to each other. But then the, the last area is that our love is demonstrated is a love for the lost, for the world. And this, again, is shown by our commitment. And, you know, the whole purpose of the church, uh, what was the last commandment the Lord gave the church before he ascended? He gave the Great Commission. The Great Commission was to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. And so, you know, we do that through uh, supporting, of course, missionaries, but we go out ourselves, too, out into our community and share the good news, the gospel message. You know, and I believe that is the way we demonstrate our love for the lost is by telling them about Jesus. They haven't met him. They don't know who he is. They don't know the truth. They have to be told. And that's our job as a church is to share the good news, the great, um, is to fulfill the Great Commission, to do our part. One final scripture verse for you this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Paul here again is writing to this church. And he starts out, or in verse number 3, he says that, as he's, uh, he says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. Now, he, he talks about the church's labor of love. What was their labor of love and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus in the sight of God our Father? What was the labor of love? Well, a little bit later on, I think he, he expounds and, and describes what this church's love was focused on. And he says this in verse number eight, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. And so all, you know, uh, the, this church, Paul was, uh, was talking about their labor of love, how they demonstrated their love for the lost was by telling the lost about Jesus. It was by their commitment to the Great Commission. All throughout the Gospels, as we, we look at the life of Jesus, when his earthly ministry, all throughout there, you see when Jesus, uh, when he saw the multitudes, what does the Bible say? He had compassion. on He was moved with compassion. The question is, is do we see lost people the way Jesus we have the love of God within. We need to let it grow and abound in our life. And, you know, the, uh, um, the question is, is do we see the lost, lost people the way that Jesus sees them? So this morning, let's be reminded, as we read this portion of Scripture here, this new commandment, let's be reminded of these things this morning. A Christ-like love is motivated towards others. It's not self. It's not a love for things. It's towards others. And it is a natural response to those who are saved. You know, having those that have the indwelling of the Spirit of God, love is the first uh, fruit of the Spirit that is mentioned, is love. And all throughout Scripture, it needs to be uh, the focus there. And so the question this morning, and I'll leave you with this, is are we demonstrating our love? Are we demonstrating our love towards God, like we ought to be, towards our church family? And are we demonstrating our love towards the lost, like we should? I pray that, you know, as our church moves forward and as we build uh, this building and uh, break ground this next week, it's exciting. 
should do announcements every Sunday school pastor. Those were some exciting announcements. Um, a lot of good things, of course, happening, but let's not forget why we're uh, building a, a building there. A bigger building is so that people can come, uh, be invited to the church to hear the gospel message. So important, but you know, we're, it's going to be um, some ups and downs, I'm sure, over the next 10 to 12 months as we go through that building project. We need to be focused on one another, too, as a church and our love towards, uh, towards each other. But, of course, most of all, let's always show our love to, to our wonderful. All right, you are dismissed. Thank you for your attention.